Hello and happy Tuesday. Welcome to another episode of The Healing Home. I'm your host, Michelle, and today we are going to be talking about electroculture. It's one of the more popular topics that has been popping up all around throughout networks that at least I'm paying attention to in terms of the gardening aspect of things, natural ways to preserve what Mother Nature has brought to us, and how we can cultivate better gardens and higher yields of crops, and in, in turn, a healthier lifestyle for ourselves and the people around us, right? So I am really honored to have my guest today, Matt Roski of Cultivate Elevate. And, you know, Matt is one of the leading voices in this topic uh, right now. And when I was uh, doing my own research on my own accord about electroculture, I came across his channel and I really loved his demeanor. I loved his story. I loved how he is just kind of like very streamlined, straight to the point about this stuff. He's very well researched. And, you know, with all of that said, he's just one of those people that I can tell is just really helping this movement come out and for more people to find it. So, you know, Matt's a, a busy man, so we have limited time with him. Um, so with that said, let's just get into it and help me in welcoming Matt to the stream. Hello. Hi, Matt. How's it going? Good, good. Can't complain. Awesome. Great to see you. Thanks for being here. Um, and, you know, uh, let's just jump right into it. And I wanted to say first, though, in honor of our show today, I brought in one of our solid copper spheres that we have. Ooh, so, nice. yeah, my boyfriend and I bought these, uh, gosh, a handful of years ago at an event. It's a tarot symposium that comes through um, our area. And these things are just freaking amazing. And, you know, copper has just been a huge part in our life. And, um hearing and learning about all this electroculture stuff, I'm like, I've got to bring the copper in for this stream. <laughs> so, like yeah. So um, if you would, could you just, um, you know, introduce yourself uh, for people who might not know who you are? Um, tell us a little bit about your story and how you found electroculture. So I'm Matt and I'm the owner of Cultivate Elevate. And we started our company back in 2020 to provide solutions to all the nonsense in which we face, right? We're always bombarded with a lot of different fear and, you know, we're running out of this and we might have health issues on this or our terrain has been impacted on this way. But in reality, there are always solutions. That's what I've realized. And that's what our company has been about is providing solutions, whether it's, you know, from our gardening, from our health, from our food, from our water, you know, all the different things just that are very simple, simple things that can be done to elevate our terrain. But I got into electroculture when I did an Akashic reading back in 2020, right? So I had an Akashic reading done and the lady that I reached out to, she was a sweet lady out of Ireland. Um, she told me to look into crop circles and I was like, okay, I don't know what I'm going to learn about crop circles. I guess I'll just go look at them. And she goes, when you, when you go and look at them, you'll figure it out. And I was like, okay, but what was interesting about this reading with the Akashic reading, she told me my entire timeline of my life and everything up to when I was basically 35, every single thing exactly to the T over the telephone. So I was pretty blown away. So I, you know, I thought that she knows, right? Like she, she can't just be pulling these things out of thin air or ether as we should say now. But anyway, so with that, I, I started going into crop circles and I started understanding that they were cymatics or like a language being spoken to us, right? The earth is emitting this language and it's emitting these beautiful designs, these fractals, these beautiful things, and it's communicating, right? Our, our, everything is communicating all the time. And that's kind of how I see crop circles now as almost like a way of communication between the language of the earth and us. Now we can't really understand them because they're in symbols and different you know, images, but a lot of it relates to either up above in the stars or something going on on the earth at the same time, which I always found really fascinating. But when I got into that, I started understanding, I started going more into then pyramid energy and understanding the powers of the pyramids and how pyramids have been used to preserve food, to boost agriculture, to help improve meditation, bring plants back to life, which have been extinct for up to 20 years. You know, all these beautiful things that pyramids were doing. That's why people used to wear the dunce cap Right. People were children in school. They used to place a dunce cap on top of their head 
because the cells are actually spinning the opposite direction. And when they would place the pyramid onto their head, they would be able to focus because their cells start spinning back the opposite direction. So I got into pyramid energy and I started learning all about this. And I thought, this is wild, you know, and it, and I always had a thing for energy. I was in the fitness world. I watched people do a thousand pound deadlifts in front of me, a thousand pound squats. I've seen just about everything. I would use my voice, chant, you know, get people pumped up. I've seen energy on the physical spectrum. But when I got into this, it made more into this, you know, mental and spiritual and moving into it. And as I started jumping into those different rabbit holes and reading all these books and connecting things to energy, like the book, The Invisible Rainbow, which I highly recommend every person to look into. Great book on the toxic frequencies, uh, and, you know, on our terrain. But as I started going into that, I got into Victor Schauberger's work. And Victor Schauberger's work was just remarkable. What he did with water, what he did with copper, what he did with this beautiful bio plow and all these different tools and things. He understood that if we harmonize our, if we harmonize our terrain, our terrain, our terrain will work with us, right? Nature will work with us. If we go against it, nature will go against us, right? And so it's very important to always remember that. But Victor Schauberger led me into the electroculture different ploys, right? So when I got into electroculture, I started learning about how we can harness the atmospheric energy that's all around us, right? And what he was showing was when we go to place copper into our soil. So back up a little bit. In, when you get into electroculture, there's a very simple way to start. You can take a piece of wood, wrap it with copper, and make an antenna, place that into the soil, and that will work as an atmospheric antenna by providing the plants with energy and also harnessing the energy that's all around them. So that's the start of electroculture. But when I got into Victor Schauberger's work, he had this whole thing on how iron is very toxic to the soil. It blocks up the energy. It blocks up the magnetism. It leads to more slugs, right? A lot of people, when they're having slug issues, it's too much iron in the soil. And copper, on the other hand, is actually very healing. It helps retain moisture. It keeps the soil flowing with the energetic principle, and it's very beneficial. And as I got into these two topics, there was an article that came out that talked about how Victor Schauberger in the 1940s presented all of this to the Bulgarian government and said, I'm going to make you copper tools. I'm going to make you everything out of copper. I'm going to make you, you know, different gardening tools, all these things out of copper. The government at that time told them that they were getting kickbacks from the fertilizer company. So they could not go through with this idea because it was going to compete against the fertilizer that they were selling at that time. So what they did was they put out a news broadcast that said anybody who uses copper in their gardens is going to yield too much food and not make enough money. So all the farmers at that time pretty much said, oh, we don't want to do anything with this, right? This is not good for us. We're not going to make any money. So all of Victor Schauberger's work was lost instantaneously like that. And that whole thing just changed my world. And when I read that one part, that's kind of when I started trying it, right? So what I did was I took a piece of wood and I took some copper and I just stuck an antenna into, into my Moringa pot on my balcony. And the average Moringa pods, when you usually get them from Moringa, are about six inches. When I put this antenna into my, so uh, into my pot, mine were 14 to 22 inches long. So I was blown away by the size, and that's what's happening now. So now if we fast forward, this was last year. So now if we fast forward to 2023, I'm, I, I get a ton of messages every single day of people's plants just going absolutely wild. And it's been such a journey. But when I read that one part about the farmers and how you know the, they were deceived right by the money, it made me realize I need to put this information out there. I need to speak about this. I need, this needs to be said because we faced all, all of us faced, you know, food shortages and nonsense, whatever in 2022 and 2023. And it's like back in 1941, you already knew this, right? Back in 1939, you already knew that. And then if we go back farther, 1920s, you had Justin Cristo flow who was doing all this with electroculture, George Lakofsky, who was doing all this with electroculture. So now we're going even farther back. So, and then if you look at the books, which were presented, there were books created and, and studied by the government 
on electroculture in the night in 1905. So you knew about all of these practices and tendencies and how we can boost our yields. But in reality, we were told a completely different story. So that's kind of the nutshell of electroculture. Now I got into it. Yeah. Wow. I love this. I love that story. And, you know, the whole suppression, I mean, anybody who is looking into anything and trying to figure out how this world actually maybe probably works, we realize that there's been so much suppressed. So many things are an inversion, just a complete 180 of, of what is really going on. What they tell us is going on. You can usually assume that it's the opposite, right? Um, and this stuff, you know, this is, it's one of the things that to me, when I heard you talking about this, especially the details about the farmers being told they weren't going to make money and all these things, it's like, as you said in the beginning, fear will create such a stifling negativity that you can't really, um, it takes a lot to break through. And so the moment you tell someone you're going to lose money, mm, most people will, will end up stopping doing whatever they're saying is going to make them lose money. Right. And so to think that this was the thing, and I've even heard you talk about, you know, that this goes back even further, obviously, like to, you know, times of Tartaria and the Egyptians and that this, this technology, you know, when we sit around or we, we used to sit in class and hear how the, there were people pulling big bricks to create these pyramids and all this stuff. And, you know, that we're programmed to think that that's how it is. But when you think about the advanced technology that was, is still available to us today and was available to these more primitive people. Uh, when you look at it, they actually were very primitive at all. They were very at the forefront of what was actually really going on and had such a deep understanding of how this universe actually works. Um, and so to think that, you know, we've all been, our, our, uh, our lineages are tapped into this information. And I think that's why it is becoming such a popular topic now, because just like with plants and herbalism, what I've learned from working with plants anyway, is that once you start tapping into plants and you start listening to their language and you just sit with them and you literally treat them as though they're a person, you're there to talk with them. You communicate with them. They communicate back. And it's something deep within all of our DNA, at least I believe, this, this innate connection with plants, with nature. And that, like you said, once you start working with it, things just start to flow. And then it's one thing after another. Oh, my goodness, this is all going on and it's happening. And so it's such a beautiful, beautiful thing. Go ahead. I was going to say I completely agree. And there's a great book. It's called The Secret Life of Plants mm -hmm. by uh, Peter Tompkins and or Christopher Tompkins. And they go into that. They talk about uh, Baxter. I think Baxter or Baxter. He used to take an EKG system and set it up to plants. And plants would be exposed to somebody, let's say, crying or have an emotional state or getting wounded or just, just all different types of states. And the plants had the EKG went off on the plants every single time something was happening and especially when something was happening to their owner right because the plants were connected up to 2000 miles away to their owner and this was remarkable he showed in one of his ekgs the owner went out on like a skiing trip i think like fell down the mountain and, and broke his leg and as they were recording the ekgs the thing just started fluttering and the as the plant started fluttering and the ekg started going off the, the, I, I believe his name was Baxter. He called up the owner of, of the, the garden and asked her, did you get injured? And the guy goes, yeah, I just fell down a mountain. And it was shown that 2,000 miles away, those the plants were picking up on them. And like you just said, Marcel Vogel talked a lot about this as well, too, where he would sit down and sit with plants and his wife <laughs> would tell him, how long are you going to sit there? And he goes, until they start communicating. And he was a great soul who knew so much about crystals, quartz, and all these things. But he sat down and realized you can communicate with plants, right? They can read your emotions. They can read your thoughts. They have a, you know, a central nervous system. Their sap and their, the, the sap or the blood of the plant. These are all, like you said, things that we used to be connected to. But through our educational system, things just became trees, right? And it just became a species. And it just became... You know, this is X, Y, Z. But in reality, we're not out there connecting with the trees, connecting with these, you know, beautiful trees and plants and, and understanding how much life force is there. 
And what I started to realize with the electroculture movement, which is going on, is we're supporting that. We're supporting the trees, the electrical conductivity of the plants, the electrical conductivity of the earth, right? Because when they're placing all this iron into the soil and all this iron into everything, they're gunking it all up. They're blocking the life force. And then the plants can't, their root system gets all blocked up and then things cannot move. But when we start bringing back in the copper and the electroculture and, and quartz and crystals, and as you showed me that little copper ball, you know, all these different things, we can be bringing back antennas from the past, right? Like you just said about the Tartaria, now we're going into old world buildings, which used to be just covered with antennas, right? What was the first thing they removed off all these old world cathedrals and buildings? The antennas. Why? Because those antennas can harness the atmospheric energy and also provide people with free energy, right? And that's, I think, the big kicker of all of this in which we're leading is not only are we taking back our food and then also taking back our water, but we're also moving into a path where we can take back our energy and have our own energy for free rather than this meter system and all this goofy stuff that we've been faced with for the last 100 years. Yes, entirely true. And, you know, one of the things, too, with the energy thing, um, the dependency that we all have on it, and clearly here we are at screens and, you know, we have, you know, we're using them and that and all of those things. So I'm grateful for it. But at the same time, it's like you, it's all about boundaries. You know, you have to have boundaries with within your life in general. And I think the whole idea of having to be plugged into something, you know, and then dependent upon a company to truck in this electricity from wires and what have you. And, you know, most people who are, uh, you know, sensitive enough, or even if you're not sensitive enough, you know, you drive past these, you know, we live in the Columbia Gorge. So there's a, there's a dams, you know, throughout the gorge. And there's a pretty large one that's, you know, it's, it's far enough from us where it's not affecting us. But when you drive through that area, just the, you know, the buzz that's in the air from all of this stuff. And to me, it just, it even just looks it doesn't look as human as free energy would, but with something like electroculture or something as welcoming as like an, a nice copper antenna versus what you see these monstrosities of just big old, you know, metal, uh, you know, kind of almost skyscraper-esque sort of formations where our electricity is pumped through. And it's all about control, you know, and taking people's power away. And that's one of the things that is just so glorious about the electroculture and seeing all these people, you know, people I know, uh, people just online, people I've seen through you who are just, they're implementing it. They're just going, okay, cool. I can go to the hardware store. I can buy this copper. There's sticks everywhere. Let's go. And it's really cool to just see people taking it into their own hands. Because once we stop, once we stop doing that, you know, that's when more control can just come in, you know. So it's been an interesting thing to just see people really uh, going, taking this and running with it. It's cool. No, I, I absolutely love it. And everything that you just mentioned is also in that book, The Invisible Rainbow. Of okay. These toxic frequencies and power lines and, and, and the dams and all of this, right? Because think of what a dam is doing. It's blocking up the energy right? The water cannot flow anymore. So it's, it's holding everything back. And water is always flowing, right? Every creek, every river you see is always flowing. So you get this stagnant water, which has no more life force, then you create dead water. And then you start to have all these weird algae blooms and, you know, everything else that they can't seem to figure out why it's happening. It's like, because you've blocked all the life force from flowing, you're, hold, you're withholding it. And then when you go into, like you said, even those power lines and those things, right now you're cooking the top of the head. A lot of people get a lot of static. That's why a lot of people start losing a lot of hair on top of their scalp. Because when they're using, for example, maybe like a plastic comb all the time or rubbing plastic on the scalp, they're creating static up there. And then if you combine it with, like you just said, those power lines, now you have an abundance of static on here and that can impact the hairline and then also the brain. And I've realized with this electroculture movement as it's been going, the coolest part is that, like you said, the creativity, right? Finding copper, finding quartz, finding different things. And then I even had a friend, uh, she took a voltage meter and was showing everybody how many volts she's getting, you know? So it goes to show it's like we could be harnessing all this energy that's around us in a natural way that's not diminishing our life force at the same time, right? Because our whole system 
first off, electricians don't know how electricity even works, right? We don't even know where it really comes from. This is where it goes into. So then if we don't know how it works, how do we know what it's doing to our body, right? Or like the any, any, and yeah, when you think about it. But when you go into it, we can do things in a more natural way, like the old world buildings and all the old world times, right? They understood when you stack certain materials together, they complement each other. First, when you're putting all this plastic and steel and, and just running wires all over the place, you're not going to have a beautiful terrain. And then everything is going to suffer, which then creates what I've learned is additional industries, right? You have one industry to another industry, and then it's an adapter to an adapter, but you never resolved the terrain issue in the first place or the root cause. So in my opinion, electroculture brings that back and then also takes people off of the grocery system or the grocery stores, right? Our grocery stores, when food is sitting underneath LED lights or fluorescent lights, it's been shown in the book by Dr. John Ott, Health and Light, that nutritional deficiencies or nutrition, I'm sorry, nu nu the nutritional value of food is diminished by up to 95% when it's exposed to fluorescent bulbs for over like 10 minutes, right? So even just a simple thing. So in the grocery store, right? You're, you're messing up the food. And then on top of it, if there's, let's say, shortages, which are created by the corporations to try to increase their price and whatever else, then what happens is, is the person doesn't even have access to the food. So at least with the electric culture, what you're doing is you're shortening the ability for you or short, yeah, you're reducing the ability for you not to be able to get food, right? The food is The food is at your doorstep or at your backyard or at your balcony or in your house, I have people growing potatoes up to their, you know, up to their ceiling in their house. So you're shortening all of that and then getting rid of that weird point in between, right? The transitional point in which food is moving from, let's say, the farm to the store is the part in which they do all kinds of weird stuff. They spray it with all kinds of things and then whatever else, you know, so if we can get rid of that and then take back our power, then we can start to elevate our health and then get all those nutrients back that I was mentioning, which are getting diminished through this processing or preservative time in which the food is going through. So yeah, it's, it's a win-win on so many different ways. And we just, our systems are, they're, they're broken and they've been broken for a long period of time. But I think electroculture is a founding solution to start fixing little things each step at a time. Yeah, I fully agree. And, you know, the grocery store, Oh, oh my goodness. I mean, I, we, I could do a whole episode. I could do multiple episodes on all the things I noticed in a grocery store. Um, but that is, I'd never heard about the LED uh, lights um, and how quickly the mineral content diminishes, but it makes sense because you're working with blue light versus the red light, you know, the red healthy light, which is obviously more of what the natural sunlight would give us. Um, so it makes sense that that depletes uh, the, the nutrients because it depletes us too. You know, you're under full fluorescent lights at work or at school or these grocery stores, wherever, most places you go now too. And even, you know, my boyfriend and I were talking about it a couple months ago or something, but you can't even, it, you have to really study the light bulb section at like a local hardware store. I mean, you have to really, I mean, I'm already picking everything up and reading labels like till day's end anyway at stores. But with light bulbs, I was like, oh my God, can I just get a regular light bulb? Like that isn't LED. And you have to really read the fine print even on these light bulbs because most all of them our LED lights. And um, it's just, it's so wild to me how that goes. And I think too, what's, what's cool. And I think what will happen with the electric culture, because one thing I observe in grocery stores is how people, it's like a mindless drone sort of thing. And so everything in there kind of allows you to go into drone mode, the lights, the crappy music, the straight lines of the aisle. You know what I mean? You're yeah. not really... I don't know. I think most people are really checked out when they're there. Yeah. And the amount of people I just what, like see just tossing their food into the cart, kind of like, okay, I got a bag of salad, toss it in. I got this. And they're just like literally throwing it in. And I just think to myself, you know, uh, there's no real genuine love connection there. Um, if you're literally just throwing it in, it's like, that's what you're going to be eating. You're putting that in your body. So that already that intention of you just kind of grabbing it, well, I have to get food. And you're just like kind of piling it in. And then people do the same thing. They just pile it in their mouths and then they don't think about it or 
what have you. And so I think um, seeing more people doing uh, this electroculture stuff and then realizing that they can produce food for themselves and their family, I think um, it, leading by example is always the best thing to do. And so I, I always try really hard to just do that in my own life because I think that the more and more people that do this, there's going to be more and more people that may have never even considered gardening they might think this is like, wow, really? I have to try it just to just to see if it works, you know? And then if it works for them, which it probably will, that being a motivating factor, like, you know, just bar none. So it's it's really cool. I mean, I, I'm pumped on it. And to me too, it's so cool that this has been around for so long and it's interesting how things in our lives go like that, you know? There's this ebb and flow where things come back into popularity and then they go out again. Um, because I first uh, came across uh, the concept of electroculture, I don't know, maybe like seven years ago or something in this book I have. It's just called Old Time Gardening Wisdom. And it's this man who goes through all of the methods that his grandmother used to use. It's by Jerry Baker. And it's a great book. And he talks about electroculture. And he oh, talks wow. about how his grandmother used to incorporate this. And as he was a little boy, you know, she he said that she would even put, you know, bicycle spokes or, you know, she would just have all these little trinkets that she would have and he didn't understand what it was. And then she explained it to him in, in a way that a grandma would explain it to a, a grandson. And he writes about that. And I remember my mind was kind of blown at that concept thinking, oh my goodness, like what? I've never heard of this. And then now to see it just, you know, be re revitalized is very cool. Well, very, very think, cool. And I think like you said, is we've, we've, we've forgotten those things, right? People used to take a penny and throw it in the bouquet, you know, at a wedding so that the plant would stand up the whole time throughout the when they would hold it through the wedding. Ah. Right? With the copper situation, you know, we can go back into time. Everybody used to have copper watering cans. That used to be the thing. Remember, everybody had a copper watering can and then it had a curved spout, which was very important because it keeps the structure of the water as it's pouring. You know, so copper was used so much. And then you have copper gardening tools. Right. That used to be very popular till the iron thing took over. And what I've started to realize is, is a lot of this information, like you just said, was lost because of the resets of World War One and World War Two. Right. When a lot of people were lost and a lot of information was removed from society during that time, a lot of this information or these practices were lost. And it was interesting because when I got into electroculture, too, there was one book by Justin Cristo Flo, which I believe he wrote in like 1910. But the only copy was uploaded in an Australian library, the PDF, and that's pretty much it. There, I haven't seen many other copies of that book, but if someone didn't upload that copy into a library and then it go on to, let's say, the Internet and we're all communicating now, a lot of his work was completely lost because all of the Google patents or patents which used to be listed on Google, have a lot of them were all taken off, right? When they had the 1951 invention secrecy act due to national security right they would hide certain uh inventions because of the fact that they are you know a national threat but those could also be his apparatuses and other things related to using copper free energy all these beautiful things in which we can be doing but yeah with the with the electroculture it just made me realize like a lot of this stuff was done in the past and if we go back even a little bit farther you go 1880s and then let's say uh, 1850s, a lot of the, the, the cathedrals, the mosques, the temples, the churches, they have atmospheric antennas on top of them that are usually connected to a piece of copper wire that runs down into the garden, which is next to them. And when you ever see all of these places, these sacred buildings or these sacred places, their gardens are nuts. They have sacred geometry. It's absolutely stunning. You're walking through orchards and, and seeing all kinds of things because they understood electroculture too. They just didn't talk about it, right? And then that also goes back to, in my opinion, the dependence, right? You're depending on if they got all the food, you got to go to them. Just like if the grocery store has all the food, you have to go to them. And to take it one step further is the hardware stores, right? A lot of the stuff that they sell at the hardware stores is loaded up with iron, right? When you turn over all of these things, they're all loaded up with iron or they're made out of plastic. And that plastic was created by DuPont to diminish the life force or the energy, right? So the, the, you got these plastic water bottles or plastic watering cans 
You got plastic and rubber hoses. You got these weird Wi-Fi things to tell you how much water to use and all kinds of weird, strange stuff, which is altering the frequencies. But it almost, you can almost say they're deliberately trying to make it harder for you to grow food so that you're more dependent on the grocery stores and the system. And electroculture, in my opinion, breaks all that because now you don't need any of the chemicals. You don't need any of the pesticides. You don't need any of that because things start thriving and bees start coming around, pollinators start coming around, all these beautiful things because they also pick up on energy. And that's a big reason why when a person has a garden and they're saying, I have all these bugs and I don't know why these plants are, these bugs are eating my plants. The reason being is the, the bugs are coming to clean up the mess. They understand that the plant is on its last limb. It's emitting frequencies that it's, it's showing that it's not going to be there. So the insects come and clean it all up, right? That's the beautiful part of nature. So if we spray things all over to get rid of the insects, right? Then nature is not allowed to do its thing. And then there's no recycling process. And then you start to have even worse infestations and all this other stuff over time because you're going against nature. Dude, indeed. And oh, I love the, yeah, the, 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 the weave with the iron I'm very fascinated by because when I've been thinking about electroculture, when I sit and just meditate on this, one of the first things that comes to mind is with the copper V being connected to Venus, which is, you know, a feminine energy, obviously. And then when I start really thinking about this, it's like, okay, so I feel as though what we're really harnessing, we're like harnessing the energy of the divine feminine with this. Okay. And then, you know, and I see you nodding because I know, you know, I know you understand this. And that's why I've been so excited to bring this up to you because it's just like, when you think about Venus and the, the symbolic properties, the energetic properties, we're talking about fertility and beauty and warmth and all of these just abundant sort of energies, um, which is what you want in a garden. So it makes sense that we would be pulling this in, um, this copper Venus beautifying energy and the iron. Now the iron is more masculine. It's more projective. It's more heavy. It can be even on like a magical level, like certain practitioners won't use iron or there's very special circumstances where you would use iron and where you wouldn't use iron. And then, you know, even like on a physical level, you know, uh, men have more, um, men have a higher uh, level of iron in their blood and then women have a higher level of copper. And so to me, it's very beautiful to kind of see these sorts of energetic weaves as well. And that's just one of the things that I kind of wanted to throw into the mix with you because it's like one of the first things that popped into my head when I was really thinking about this on a symbolic level and what it really means and uh, what we're really doing. And I don't know, what do you think about all of that kind of stuff? I mean, I think that plays a role on a lot of things, because when you look at iron, how it's created, it's actually very difficult. Like, it's almost like insanely difficult to make. So it's like, why are we using this then, right? It doesn't make a lot of sense. But I like what you said. It's really bringing that beautiful Venus energy, right? And also, too, copper has levitational properties, right? It's one of those beautiful metals that have levitational properties. So you're bringing that into your garden. You're bringing... You know, it's kind of like, not to say you're doing like exterior design or in interior design, but you're kind of bringing back different colors and different speed, different hues and different spectrums, right? The biggest thing what I realized too with the color of the copper is it's the same color as the sun, right? So you're bringing that beautiful sun spectrum of the, that color into your garden, which we all know with everything going on in our skies and all this weird stuff, they're trying to get rid of that beautiful sun color that we see. It's all blue and white for the most part. You're missing out on that beautiful sunset or sunrise, which is the golden hour of the copper, right? So that copper comes in there. And then when you're combining, like we were just talking about, with different types of materials like quartz or lapis or, you know, different types of stones, now you have different spectrums, different colors, which are also increasing the energy for your plants and your garden and your backyard. Because the coolest thing is watching all the animals. People send me pictures all the time of all of their animals, whether it's a cat, whether it's a dog, whether it's a bunny, you know, any, whatever it may be. And they just love these antennas. 
and they just sit next to them and they're always next to them. They're sleeping next to them. They're digging them up, whatever it may be. Right. And you sit there and think there's something going on on the energy level that we're not seeing because all of the animals are picking it up. Even the birds. I have every bird I can ever possibly think of sit above, you know, my place and sit and circle in front of my while I do these podcasts and all the other things. They pick up on this. I've had bats. You know, I have I have all different types of insects like that I've never seen before. That's another thing, seeing beetles and different things in which I've never seen before. I saw a gray ladybug the other day. I've never seen a gray ladybug. It landed on my shoulder. You know, so all these things are picking up on this energy. And like you said, if we're using all this iron, which is just deadening everything, right? It's just heavy and it's just deadening everything. It doesn't make a lot of sense because... You know, if, if, if it's causing all that, that heaviness, then how is anything going to thrive, right? Because if everything is light and airy and we go with the wind and water, which is light and airy, it flows. Everything flows. So if we're blocking it all up with this deadening energy, then we're going to have a recipe for disaster. And that's what Victor Schauberger showed in the 1940s. He was saying that a lot of the stuff related to the dust bowls and all the things which were going on at that time, was people were just ripping up the soil with iron tools the entire time. And he's like, that's why you guys have droughts. Your soil is clumped and blocking all the water from absorbing. So you're going to have that. And he goes, that's why we need copper and bronze and brass and wood and all these other, and hemp. You know, you can go into so many different things. But yeah, it's uh, it's remarkable, the, the beauty of copper. And I feel like we've really lost track with it. But it's such a remarkable, remarkable thing. And on the note of what you said with the iron in the uh, the iron in the blood of males, females have a very high amount of copper in their blood, and that's another thing which I thought was really interesting. So you're amplifying that, you're 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 amplifying the the beautiful properties of the body, and then when we're using electrical electroculture, we're also amplifying the beautiful properties of plants. And somebody messaged me the other day and told me about how. Plants are green because the the chlorophyll, and they said, what does copper look like when it gets oxidized? It turns green. So are all plants just loaded up with copper? That's what's causing them to spout, you know, and sprout? Stuff to ask and questions that we have no answers to because our system doesn't even go into talking about these things. Wow, I love that point. Oh my goodness, that's such a great point about it turning green. Wow, I'm totally going to, yeah, meditate on that one. That's a good one. Whoa. Well, yeah, I mean, oh, I love where this is going because, you know, uh, and then when we think about it with the high copper levels of a woman, it's like, well, what are, this is mother nature, you know, it's mother nature, you know, so it's like, yeah, she's the grand woman. Here we are, you know, she, uh, she creates uh, what we need uh, when we need it. Um, And so it's, it kind of comes as no surprise that this, the copper, the heaviness of copper, not the heaviness of the copper, but the heavy amounts of copper, you know, that women carry, it would make, it makes so much sense to me when you really think about it. And um, yeah, you know, with the animals being attracted to it, um, because we're in a colder region, you know, we're still, we had snow flurries this morning. So, you know, I've been doing planting, I've been doing a lot of starts, you know, um, cause we have a solar shed and what have you, but I have erected a few antennas so far in the garden and I did it in the, uh, bed where I have a lot of the spring blooms. So, you know, hyacinths and tulips and all those things. And I'll say, they the color of them and as they lasted longer than they normally do and their color was more vivid this year that that's what i noticed and then i did notice that as soon as i erected the first antenna there were birds that were really drawn to it very quickly um and then secondly working off of the idea of working with more natural materials in the garden versus you know you go to lowe's you can buy very easy easily buy supplies to make a fence with whatever they have that their material is it's usually horrible bird netting that hurts birds and insects and stuff but just this past weekend we built a garden fence using all materials from the area and so it's called a dead hedge and there's many different types of styles Um, it's an old style of fencing you can look it up online Uh, a lot of it is it's very heavily used in, in europe 
but you basically need no hardware whatsoever. You don't need screws. You don't need nails or anything. You're literally just using what's around you. And I'll tell you, we already have a lot of birds, but the amount of birds and animals that are just been attracted just from the wood. You know, and so then my mind just starts going, oh, once I wrap this stuff with copper, baby, it's just, gonna, you know, it's going to go. And so um, anyway, it's really cool because even just making trellises out of natural material, I think is not only better for the environment, but it's better for your garden. And then it's better for bringing in these pollinators that are attracted to it because this is what they know. They know the natural world. They don't know what Home Depot looks like. They don't know the products that are there. Right. And for good reason, you know, they're better off for it, you know? Um, and so anyway, there's just so much beauty to work with. Um, and I think that it also helps to flip your mindset from scarcity into abundance. When you start working on projects like this, when you realize that, yeah, you may have to go out and buy yourself some copper wire, but you also might have some some wire from an appliance that you might never use, you might be able to strip that and there may be copper under there. You know what I mean? And I'm not saying everybody go to your cords and start stripping them, but you know, it's a, there's a, there's so much stuff in the world that can be reused and recycled. Um, and I think that when we start just like tapping into what electroculture is promoting, which is abundance versus scarcity, um, that is one of the best um, mind flips that you can do for yourself for just for life in general, um, because as we started off talking about how, you know, fear is really interesting and, and um, a lot of the programming works off of fear. And when you're in a scarcity mindset, you're, you're typically fearful very often and you're very anxious. And when you're in a scarcity mindset, you have a hard time focusing. You have a hard time just honing in on what's going on, making good decisions, using critical thought. Um, and so anyway, I know I've, I've heard you talk about this as well, but I just think that um, I just love this flip that is going to be naturally happening for the people that are ready to tap into it. Electroculture can be a way for them to actually start to change their mindset, which will change their life ultimately, really. Well, and I, I completely agree with you. And, and also, like you said, you're using what's around you. You know, even when I was talking about creating these antennas, you know, I've explained when people are creating antennas, go back into your, go into your backyard, pick up wood that's in your backyard that is already in your backyard because it resonates at the same frequency as you. And it's interesting because I was reading a book the other day and they were talking about how there's a thing called wood waves, which are the low emitting frequency that come off the wood, right? So if you think about it, if you created that entire fencing system based out of wood, with no weird things in it, right? You just used wood. Think of the waves that are coming off of that fencing at let's say about two, uh, two hertz. I think it's 1.6 1, 1. hertz, which is uh, phi or phi, whatever that is. So, you know, 1.6 hertz that are coming off the wood, right? So now if you're stacking them on top of each other, what are you then creating? The piezoelectric effect that we learned about in, in school. So now you're amplifying that field and then, like you said, all these birds and everything start picking up on that. They know where to go, right? Philip Callahan, in his one book, explained, if you're ever hungry, just follow the animals. They'll know exactly where to go. You know, the birds, they know exactly where the food is. Just follow them, you know? And, and that's the thing is, as we do all this and we implement all of these things, we're, we're balancing out our terrain and then also assisting nature. You know, Mother Nature needs help, right? Like, we can't just expect... These people who want to save us are not about saving us. That's for sure. It's quite the opposite, you know, so mother nature needs its help and we have to do it at our, in my opinion, the grassroots level. And that's what this has kind of started where people are now just designing different things, trying different things, using different shapes, using different materials, you know, and working with whatever they have too, right? Because everything that you have, you might have big stones in your backyard that are maybe like granite stones. And you could take those stones, stack them up on top of each other so that they're all pretty much kind of like a dolmen. That's what they used to do with the druids, but the, the dolmens, and that will amplify the energy fields of the backyard just by simply stacking the stones on top of each other. So we can be using all these natural or materials from nature, right? Not all these weird plastics. Because when I started researching and understanding plastics, I started realizing that they block the ether, which is interesting. So if we're putting all this weird plastic all over, you're blocking the ability for the energy to flow. 
versus when you're using wood and stone and everything that's in your backyard, the energy can flow right through it and then flow right around it using copper as well, too. So, yeah, there's endless possibilities with this. And I think it just opens up the doors into so many more things. And with the amount of messages that I receive and the amount of things that are occurring, it's just going to, yeah, it's going to change things. I even had a buddy who told me he's now a frequency farmer and he does farming with frequencies, you know, and he's all about it. So think of that. If we start using frequencies like bird sounds and all these beautiful classical music, Beethoven, Bach, all those things, think of how much more we can add. And that was shown in the book, Dorothy Redelac, The Music of Sound and Plants. She showed all of that, that sounds can increase plant growth, right? So if we have all this this noise all around us, it's diminishing that. So all these things can be used to elevate our terrain, our health, and then also our, our home, right? Because that's where I realize it starts. It starts at our home and it's up to us. And that's kind of where it all began with electroculture. I, I love that. It all it all starts with the home and it all starts with us. It's like because you know, we are our own antennas, you know, we're all an antenna. And so what we put out, it gets picked up by whatever's around us. So if you're putting out negativity, you're putting out whatever the heck is going on, other people around you pick up on it, whether or not that person realizes it, or you realize it or whatever, it is emitting this frequency. And I think too, like, I just think about, um, you know, if you're wearing copper jewelry, even, or you are gardening with copper, um, you are, you are then the electroculture antenna in your own garden, walking through the world, walking through the forest, whatever, you know, you're bringing that in as well. Um, and so there's something very beautiful about that. Uh, um, and yeah, I'm, I'm excited for all this stuff and it's, it's really cool. And so, um, yeah, I just, uh, I've been so honored to talk with you and I feel like, yeah, we could probably talk and talk and talk and there's so many points to be brought up. Um, but you know, um, I just want to give you a chance. Uh, the platform is yours now to, um, you know, let people know where they can find you. Um, I know that you offer, um, some wonderful superfoods and mushroom powders and things on your website. So if you want to shout that out and direct people where they can, um, get those products too. And, uh, um, all of Matt's links are also done in the description below, but the floor is yours, my friend. Of course, so you guys can find us on CultivateElevate.com. Our website has a whole plethora of information from videos, podcasts, information about what we're talking about right now, and then all of our beautiful superfoods, which all of our superfoods are just designed to heal different parts of the body. For example, we have pearl powder, which is great for the eyes, great for the skin, great for the hair, great for the nails, and also going into vibration. The pearl vibration is the ocean, right, and the water, which is very important. And then we have dragon's blood, which is remarkable for the skin. It's the ancient tree sap of the Draco tree. And tree sap, as we know, is very, very healing. Like if we think about turpentine and all the pine saps and maple syrup and all those beautiful saps, right? That's very, very healing. And it can work really well for, you know, anything related to skin and related to the digestion, the brain, energy. You know, people are having maybe chronic fatigue. Shilajat can also be a great one which can provide the body with 84 of 102 minerals and get the body going again, getting the digestion going, and is loaded with fulvic, fulvic acid, which fulvic acid is the same stuff that's in the soil that's keeping everything just going. So, you know, we're big on on, on food food as our sources, right? Everything is from, a, from nature, and we don't put any preservatives or fillers or any weird things in any of our stuff. It's all just as, as, as pure as it can be. And you can find us more on YouTube. We also have a great YouTube page. We have a Rumble and a Telegram, Cultivate Elevate. And then last but not least, our Instagram. We have two different pages on there, Cultivate Elevate and then Cultivate Elevate 2. But I try to share to everything because when I first even started talking about this, I got censored multiple times for just even bringing up this topic. So, you know, I try to put information out there everywhere on every different platform. And if anybody ever has a question about anything from this podcast or anything else, they can always just send us a message and we're more than happy to send you a plethora amount of information on how to get started and what to do. And just, you know, books, because I'm big on people reading books because we've lost that. We've lost where we sit down with the beautiful book that is made out of linen 
and other materials which are natural to our hands, right? They used to use linen on all the different covers of the books, you know, linen and paper. So, you know, when we, when we connect back to those books, we start to access different parts of our brain. And same with you and your meditations, same exact thing. You start going into different parts of your brain. So I'm very big on that. But yes, you can find a plethora of information on our website. And if anybody has any questions, they can always send us a message. But we're more than happy to help. And like I said, just try it, right? Just try it. You have nothing to lose, right? And only things to gain. That's kind of what I've started to realize. Because we've been taught to keep a closed mind on a lot of topics. And usually our instinct or our gut is correct on all of those things. But our closed mind keeps us from doing them. So just try it, test it out, see how it goes, take pictures, see what happens with you, put them around, see, you know, and then go from there. And I kind of see it as the sky's the limit with all of the electric culture and where it's going to go from here. Beautiful. I couldn't agree more and just want to say thank you for all the work you're doing. And I have to commend you for, yes, your social media game is is very good because I have, that's one of the things that I noticed about you is that you are sharing so much of this stuff and that is the point of social media to be social. And so when I see people doing that, it, it, you're working, you're working with the tool in the way that it's meant to be worked with. And that's how you get your stuff out there. And so, yeah, highly recommend Matt's channels. And I've learned a lot just by watching and listening to what he's doing and all, all the interviews he's been having. So again, thank you for everything you're doing. And thank you for spending some time with us here in the healing home. I really appreciate it. And I hope to talk to you again in the future at some point. Um, and, and uh, yeah, we can riff a little bit more on, on all of this stuff and maybe get into some other areas um, uh, that kind of coincide with this. But, you know, it all is connected. So thank you so much. No problem. Happy to be here. And you guys have a great day. Yep. You too, Matt. See ya. All righty, y'all. Well, I've got some updates for you for anyone who wants to stick around, but boy, that was such a great chat and I really, really admire Matt and what he's doing and all the work that they're putting in. So um, as I mentioned before, the book that I talked about is here, it's kind of shining with the light. Old Time Gardening Wisdom, Lessons Learned from Grandma Putt's Kitchen Cupboard, Medicine Cabinet, and Garden Shed. This is a wonderful book with tons of recipes for natural uh, fertilizers, uh, ways to harvest, how to make your own trellises, electroculture, what have you. Um, so yeah, it's, uh, it's a wonderful book. If you can find it, I bet you can find it online somewhere. Um, but I'll pull up some slides for everybody here. If you're interested in sticking around and hearing my stuff, no pressure. All right, let's add this to the stream. All right. So just wanted to say thank you to all the patrons. You know, uh, my patron page is new. And so I've been having more people joining, which is seriously so much appreciated. So thank you to Chance Garten, uh, Binaboo, Lockjaw, Jane, Liam, Liam Shrimp, Anderson, and Amy Messner. Thank you guys so much. Uh, really appreciate the support. As I've said before, when you support me, you're supporting Mario. When you support Mario, you're supporting me. We're a unit. So um, this every little bit helps, and we just are really loving it. So if you want to sign up for Patreon, patreon.com slash the healing home, you can find me there. Um, and next week's show, I'm going to be talking about natural and herbal hair care. So I'm going to do a solo show um, from our last Thursday stream where we talked about hair as well and the Vril Society and the energetics of hair. Um, I had a lot of questions come across and I felt as though a lot of people were very interested in even learning what my hair care routine is. And over the years, I've formulated a few things that have really helped. And so I'm going to share all that stuff next week, uh, 425 uh, at 4 p.m. at the Healing Home, same place, same time. Last Thursday, every Thursday with me and Mario, we'll have a new stream this week at 6 p.m. You can join us um, and see what we're going to get into um, and it'll be fun. It's been a really fun, casual flow. So we've been really enjoying this new show together. Full Moon Offering newsletter. Um, the Full Moon Offering, I am sold out of my shampoo bar, but I do have three bars of the red clay and shea soap available. So these will be around until the next full moon, which will be May 5th. So if you're interested in purchasing one of those bars of soap, let me know. Up on the screen is my current menu of what I have going on.
Um, and as you can see, the red clay and shea soap is up there at top at the top. Um, antifungal and wound healing salve. It's a good one to stock up on now because, you know, we are going into the season where we're more active. We're outside scrapes and things like that kind of start to come up now. So that's a good one to stock up on. And um, I do have some available. And for any other inquiries, Michelle's Healing Home at gmail.com. I don't have an online store, so I do all direct sales. So you can just contact me to do that. If you want to schedule a consultation, what have you, you have a question, just reach out Michelle's Healing Home.com for my blog, newsletter, uh, consultation information. You can also text me 503 568 1569 for anything else. And with all of that said, I am going to let you guys all go and say happy Tuesday again. Thanks for tuning in. Make sure to check out Matt and Cultivate Elevate and everything he's doing. And you know what? As he said, you have nothing to lose. So get yourself some wood, some sticks from the backyard and some copper wire and give it a try and see what happens. Um, because, yeah, I think the results that are coming across for a lot of people, you know, you can't deny the results. So I hope you guys all have a really lovely day. Take care and we'll see you again next week.